Hello everyone, welcome. It's, what are we, Tuesday, August 18th, 2020. It's been a while since we've been here. So welcome back and hopefully everybody gets settled in. Now is a good time if you have a moment, you can let your contacts know that we're doing this video. And of course, as we've said before, we're posting these on my website, drbillcode.com. And there's probably a link to there from your website? I don't think we've actually put it up there yet, but I will get okay. Piper to do that. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, yeah, so I, I've got that critical password that we need, so we can get those done and keep those going. Um, we'll be doing today, and then we're about to travel. So the timing is, uh, it's a bit apropos for today's talk. You listed it as? Anesthesia. Anesthesia, sure. So um, it's Two and a half, it's, yeah, it's coming up three weeks since I had my surgery. So I thought it was a good time to talk about it. And it happens to come where we are in our, in our coverage of, you know, my book, Solving the Brain Puzzle, because we're up to, I think, up page 172, chapter 13, Anesthesia and Postoperative Cognitive Dysfunction, which has a good place uh, in a book about the brain because when we give anesthetics, it's a very fragile ecosystem. And if people are sliding part way down the hill already with their brain function, then this can really aggravate it. And it does also happen to be an issue at the extremes of life. So the very young and of course, the very old. Uh, very old is a very general term because uh, they talk about increased risk of post-operative cognitive dysfunction, which is their buzzword for it. Um, happening at 60, some say 65. I'm past both those now. Uh, in fact, in a, a little over a week, I'm at that magic 67. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what anesthesia is because not everybody has a comfort zone within it. It's kind of a unknown for most people. Most people, many people have had one uh, or more. And of course, there's different types of anesthesia, and we'll get into that a bit as we go on. So anesthesia has probably been used in some shape or form for a very long time, two or 3,000 years. Um, the original anesthesia, the, it was perfect if you took a walnut, you hit it with a hammer, just enough to break the walnut, and that might be enough to make you a bit senseless. <laughs> because the goal of anesthesia is to take away memory, pain, and hopefully movement to make the surgeon's life easier. Right. When we didn't have anesthesia, so this is back into the 1800s, not very far back, then it was a matter of a few strong men holding people. So I was very crude. And, you know, the surgeons at that time were barbers. So barbers became surgeons and eventually it came together. It's interesting in the UK, they call surgeons Mr. as opposed to doctor. Hmm. Okay, so anesthesia started to develop. It came along pretty good when we got chloroform and then eventually ether. Ether was a huge step forward and it's 150. It's coming up 200 years ago that the first components of ether were used. Ether, of course, uh, is a wonderful dry cleaning agent. Okay. And there's a clue in that because I spent a couple of years researching how anesthetics work on the brain and effectively let's consider it. Each cell has a double lipid lining around it. Right. Okay. And that double lipid lining, a simplistic way to think of it is that it's perturbed or changed slightly by the varied lipid soluble anesthetic. And that's why dry cleaning agents work well, because they're lipid dissolving. Okay, so the tetrachloral ethide or tetrachloral chloride was a very good dry cleaning agent, and so is chloroform, but so also is the other ether containing anesthetics, whether it's ether, halothane, or the more normal, newer replacements, isofluorine, and then since then, desfluorine and, and methoxyfluorine and so on. All of these are fluoride molecules 
and they're excellent for cleaning things up. Interesting. It's pretty humbling. Um, back in the early 80s, when I was working in Hudson Bay, Saskatchewan, I'd done six months training in anesthesia. And so I was needing to change some of the halothane vaporizer on the back of the anesthesia machine. Anesthesia machines are just a way that you can control very carefully what you're doing. Because anesthesia grew up as a specialty, literally because a little turn on the dial was the difference between awake, asleep, and dead. Because if you overshoot, people do badly. Or as my sons taught me, they had a, um, it was a brain game, kind of a surgical operation game. Mm -hmm. And anesthesia was, was a black and white thing gas on and gas off. So my sons used to bug me about that. It was a very simplistic thing that I did. But of course, it grew up as a specialty to monitor people and keep them those three things asleep, amnestic, hopefully, as well as still, and then in a perfect world, wake up relatively pain free. So we've always had the eternal holy grail of anesthesia was finding one agent that could do all those things. It has never worked out quite as well as we'd like. And so most often now, we use one agent to put you to sleep. In early days, that was thiopental, which was a short-acting barbiturate, okay, which were a huge deal in the 50s and 60s. And then we moved on in the 80s, late 80s and 90s, to propofol. Propofol which is a, uh, it's light looking because it's dissolved in um, soybean molecules. Mm -hmm. The same as we use to use an intralipid for nutrition intravenously, then they put it into that. And we even had a diazepam that went in that at that time. Eventually we got a water soluble benzodiazepine, midazolam, which most people know now. And so that replaced that portion. So when we look at anesthetics, we're trying to determine what is the, I guess, risk benefit ratio, because they always have some upsides and they always have some downsides. And so by using a small amount of each one, so some people call that chicken soup anesthesia, because okay. you're using many different things so that you can get the relative benefit without much of the downside or toxicity. Because if you use the whole thing of one, which was in the days of ether, I mean, it took a while to get people to sleep. And it took a while for them to wake up. When I had my tonsils out about grade eight, so it's about 14 or something, um, the guy in the next bed, he was quite a bit, he was about the same age, but he was quite a bit heavier than I was. So all that extra fat tissue, he was almost half a day waking up. Right. Because it's slower into fat, and fat's got a lot of blood vessels, remember, eight mm -hmm. miles in one pound of fat. So it was much slower to wake that up. And then it just goes on from there. So once we start to look at how anesthetics work, maybe we can get a clue as to what's happening right. in post-op cognitive dysfunction. So as a bit I talk about in the chapter, um, back in my academic days when I was teaching anesthesia and teaching pharmacology to pharmacy students, nursing students, and medical students, it was always a point of trying to coach them and make them aware, you know, what were the pluses and minuses of the whole deal. At that time, and for a very long time, we always said anesthetics are completely reversible. I'm not quite sure that's as optimal as we would like it to be. However, um, it's still kind of the buzzword because everybody would not want to think that they have to put up with it as a change. Mm -hmm. You piqued my interest with the dry cleaning thing. Have you ever had any clients who work in dry cleaning facilities? Oh, sure. Uh, inevitably so. And it's hard on the liver. Right. People that work there often have a lot of liver injury. And liver injury, because it's the main detoxifier in the body, it's not a good organ to be missing out on. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of being clear. And, and we can take it to the other extreme. I mean, for years and years, we used dry cleaning. Mm -hmm. We used to get more dressed up in suits and so on. And now we virtually never do. Mm -hmm. Because it's got some spin-off. I mean, you know what it's like to smell things. 
-hmm. when you pick them up the dry cleaning agents. Yeah. I mean, maybe there was a day you thought, oh, it was really clean, but <laughs> it's not really good because those are fairly potent agents. And I know they've got ecologic friendly dry cleaning agents now, haven't it's they? It's true, they do. I haven't used one yet though. Yeah, so I, I think they tend to use a lot more steam. Okay. Uh, steam, I mean, that's Denise's favorite way to take a stain out, like a blackberry stain. Ooh. You know, it's really dynamite. So a friend of an old, very older lady, I think originally from Norway, but anyway, years ago she taught Denise that if you take that stain, you put it over a cup of, or a bowl, and then you pour hot boiling water through it, stain's gone. Hmm. So steam goes a long way. It isn't foolproof, and there are some things you end up doing that. But for example, I, I think that's what you do in your carpet, isn't it? Or is it salt or hot water? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Steam. <laughs> yeah. Steam is good if you can get steam. Yeah. So was that was the interest about your dry cleaning agent or yep. other things? Yeah. Yeah, that was it. So the main thing, so remember, there's toxicity with it. And that's why chloroform didn't last as an anesthetic because it had considerable liver toxicity. And halothane, which was became the big agent uh, that almost effectively replaced ether. Ether's downside was it exploded. Mm. So a small amount of, of uh, electrical impulse or flame, and of course a common one in the operating room is cautery, electrocautery. So you're, you're burning the edges of vessels with an electrical output, and of course there's some smoke, and where there's smoke there's some fire. So a friend of mine had an explosion, so in the operating room. Wow. It blew him through the wall. Wow. And he was deaf in one side thereafter. Interesting fellow. Uh, he'd spent his own time in the artillery in the, in the armed forces, so he already had some challenges. And so every year when I was training in Calgary back in the 80s, he would routinely give the lecture on explosions and anesthesia. Because oh, no. it means a lot more, if you know what you're yeah. doing, talking about, right? So the other challenge that happens in anesthesia is for the longest time, and I think it's now just almost disappeared, was nitrous oxide. Mm -hmm. So nitrous oxide, some people will know as laughing gas. Some mm -hmm. people have had it in a dental chair. Some of you have had it in the emergency room with a product called Entenox, which is 50% nitrous oxide and 50% oxygen, because that can help reduce the pain a lot. I know my wife Denise had it with her, her second delivery. She had some Entenox and it helped a lot. Actually, we used anesthesia machine, but you know, that's by the by. So it's used, was used a fair bit in obstetrics, the interesting thing about nitrous oxide is we know now it has some relative toxicity. Um, it messes up B12 mm. and methionine synthetase because they did a great study on, on heart patients, heart attack patients. They said, well, this is great. We can handle their pain with this. And they did the study on it, which is good because they found that more of the people that had nitrous oxide died or did badly because prolonged use of nitrous oxide takes away your ability to make white blood cells and red blood cells. Mm -hmm. And of course you don't do well without those two. Nope. The down, other downside of nitrous oxide is it has an awful lot of oxygen in it. Okay. So it supports combustion even better than oxygen does. Okay. Okay. So the other reason within anesthesia, and there's a clue coming in here for post-operative cognitive dysfunction, is because we learned in about the 60s or 70s that people did better if we maintained the minimum oxygen going in during the anesthetic at 30%. So 30% is of course 10% or you know higher than our ordinary room air of 20, 21%, 20.8. Okay, so with that in mind, we knew that people had less problems after anesthetic by that supplemental oxygen. So the corollary of that is one way to minimize post-operative cognitive dysfunction might be we routinely use oxygen right after anesthetics in the recovery room or post-anesthesia care room. And that's because as they're waking up, they're still clearing the anesthetic and they would be relatively safer to have the extra oxygen. 
The other confounding feature is as people are waking up, most often they're warming up mm -hmm. and they're shivering. And shivering has a huge oxygen requirement mm -hmm. and something else suffers. If it's going to help the shivering, there's not as much for your brain or your heart, mm -hmm. which as we've talked about here before, are the biggest two oxygen requiring organs in the body because it's hugely needed for the energy production that's needed. So taking those pieces together, we start to get a clue. So when did I become interested in, in why people would potentially do well poorly after an anesthetic? Because up until about the 80s, we weren't learning very much about how bad anesthesia was. Mm -hmm. We had a relative marker. If people died during anesthesia, we kept reckoning back. Right. And that risk factor became known as about one in 10,000. Okay. So it sounds pretty small, but if you're a young, healthy person having, you know, something kind of cosmetic done or something that you're certainly never going to die from, it's still a terrible, terrible thing to have a death in that sort of scenario. So sometimes it was a, a drug reaction. Some of us don't handle the drugs of anesthesia very well. One that comes to mind is porphyria, which people talk about for the brain problems it has, the mental health problems with porphyria, particularly more common, interestingly, in a subset of South Africans, but it happens in the general population as well. And several anesthetic drugs trigger porphyria. Mm. So they do badly. And so they would have post-operative cognitive dysfunction, but they would have a name for it. So it wouldn't be in that group. So the... I don't think we've talked about porphyria at any point in time. The key things that trigger it typically are, are the benzodiazepines and the barbiturates. Okay, so okay. we don't use them as much and we avoid them completely in someone with that story. Right. And so you were saying that people with MS should watch out for certain anesthetics? Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's well brought up and I talk about it in the book because when I was an academic in East Statistics, you're, you're figure you know everything, right? Because you're teaching everybody about it. So you know as much as anybody. So I looked at all the literature. The other complication with an MS is if you're not doing well, then you have a lot more operations than anybody else. So it tends to be the people with MS, with the roughest MS, end up needing surgery or problems more often. Um, and of course, that, that goes back to part of why I had my surgery three weeks ago is I had a bladder stone. So I probably wouldn't have needed prostatic resection if I hadn't had MS, but the two in combination, the slightly less optimal function of your bladder in conjunction with the problem with the relative narrowing from the prostate, helped create the bladder stone. Because bladder stones happen where there isn't good drainage of the bladder <coughs> over time because I was having residual urine of a couple hundred cc's. All those pieces aside, I elected, for the reasons I'm going to talk about in a minute, with the MS, for a spinal, mm -hmm. a spinal anesthetic. So years ago, 20, 30 years ago, people tended to avoid, many anesthesiologists avoided spinals and even epidurals if they could, in someone had a neurologic problem already. And MS would fit into that. People with MS often will have problems with an arm movement or a leg movement or both, or a foot drop. All of these suggest that there may be a secondary problem in the spine. And so they didn't want to be at risk factor for aggravating that with the local anesthetics. Now we know how local anesthetics work. Local anesthetics work by blocking sodium channels. And as a consequence, probably don't have much long-term problem compared to post-operative cognitive dysfunction from a general anesthetic, okay? It's not completely the case, but it is pretty much the case. They're a much better choice. And so now all of that's been pretty well disproven. People with neurologic problems will still cope fine with a spinal or an epidural or regional anesthesia, meaning a freezing of the nerve, or just a freezing of the intravenous system on the lower arm, those sorts of pieces, so that people can do a peripheral surgery. So 
maybe that's one reason. This time I didn't. So I used to tell people, because that was what the literature said in the early and late 80s, was that the problem with anesthetics was, is if you got a fever post op. Because we know that fevers aggravate brain function and spinal cord function to some degree when you have a fever. So the people with MS at that time, the teaching was if they got a fever, which might be an infection from a surgical operation or some other cause for the fever, that of course reduces the ability of the brain and neurons to function optimally. They do not function well at high temperatures. So if you could keep the fever away, maybe that would help. So as we went forward and as I got ready to write the book, some it's nearly four years ago now, I looked this up again because I wanted to see what was the current teaching and things had changed dramatically in the last mm. 20 years. Tremendous paper by a woman from Australia and I reference it in the book in that chapter talking about post-operative cognitive dysfunction. How big a deal is it? Well, it's at least 10% of people and up to 30% of people a week to a month out. Mm. And then it's still at three months, it's still up to 10% of people. Okay. It doesn't sound like a lot, but one in 10 is pretty high in the scheme of things. Mm -hmm. And the older you are, and if you've got reduced brain function in addition, you know, maybe it's post-stroke, maybe you've got early onset of dementia or Alzheimer's, or or maybe you've got long-term MS, you're more at risk from an injury, relative injury from it, okay? Right. So that's what we worked out now, and so we're still, I think, looking for the perfect general anesthetic. Okay, so for the most part, the effects are gonna be temporary, but you could end up with some sort of lasting damage? You could. Um, and that's hard to define because it's it's only recently that we've got better at really defining how the brain is working and maybe one day somebody will spend a lot of money and do a SPECT scan study mm -hmm. because those are a nice way to get subtle information of what's happening in the brain and those are what we're doing on autism now and we're mm -hmm. doing it on depression and we're doing it on many many things so something that's very good at subtle brain study we know now that CT scan, it, it gets down to probably a millimeter or so of finding lesions or cancers and so on. But it's very for, poor for brain function. And even MRI is not mm -hmm. great for brain function. Right. Brain function is much more subtle and much more harder to diagnose and look at objectively with those tools, but you can with a spec um, and the other sorts of issues. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, so I think to, to put that in summary context, you really want to avoid anesthetics if you can. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're going to have a hip replaced or a knee replaced, easy. Do it under spinal, do it under epidural. Okay. If you're uptight and you're anxious, oh, I don't want to hear the saw, you know, I get that. Fine. Have them do those things and give you some medication intravenously, which either puts you in la-la land, or you're impervious, or you're amnestic. Right. You're amnestic for, for what's happened. And then, you know, you've got the relative best of both worlds, and you've reduced your general anesthetic. We know now, the other advantage of that is, and just to reinforce people so they can think about an epidural or a spinal, you will have less pain after surgery. Okay. The surgeons like it much better in almost all cases because where you're operating on, where the spinal and the epidural is working, and this includes cesarean section, there's less bleeding. Mm. Less bleeding makes a better surgical field for the surgeon to work in, but it also reduces the risk of blood loss for the patient. Right. So they've got less likelihood of getting blood uh, products which we try to avoid when we can. We give them when we have to, of course. But it, it is an all around better thing. The other interesting thing is it completely blocks pain from the area. Mm -hmm. So we know now the pain postoperatively is reduced if you had a spinal or an epidural or a regional anesthesia block. It's probably, the way I like to think of it is, 
you don't get all those pain messages going up to the brain, which they would in a general anesthetic. So they're going up continuously to the brain. And so you've got a lot of pathways on hyper alert, or if you want to use the gate theory of pain, but they're on hyper alert now, and they're going to have more pain post-op. Okay. And you're going to feel more pain, and you're going to need more post-op pain treatment, okay. which is never a plus. And the other relative advantage of that is if you minimize how many narcotics and maybe the narcotic uh, thing to reduce nausea and vomiting, because that's a side effect, unfortunately, of the narcotics or opiates, then all of those will contribute and aggravate the post-operative cognitive dysfunction. In fact, usually now they don't talk about post-operative cognitive dysfunction until you're at least one week post-op. Because right. all the medications and drugs, they'll screw you up that first week anyway. It's true. I don't know if you've ever visited anybody in hospital after they've had an anesthetic and you weren't sure they knew you were there or not. <laughs> But you could say you were there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what was it like for you to, to go through that operation with the epidural? Yeah, well, I, I had this with spinal. The advantage of spinal is it's quicker to put in, and it was fabulous. Okay. And I had a young, I mean, that means he's younger than I am. He's probably only <laughs> five years younger than I am. Anyway, anest anesthesiologist, but very experienced. And... He put in with it some, we call it Epimorph, which is a morphine that's water soluble and you can put into the cerebral spinal fluid or you can put it into the epidural space because mm -hmm. we will use it with cesarean section for the same reason. And it gives you really good pain relief with a tiny amount of morphine with almost no side effects, never zero, but right. I had almost none happily. And I had good pain relief for 24, 30 hours after. When it wore off, it hurt. Oh. <laughs> but, you know, behind me now, it got a lot better in the first week. Yeah. And now that I'm almost three weeks, it's, uh, you know, really very comfortable. But that's the advantage of going that extra piece. And he gave me some kind of joy juice because I don't remember virtually anything about the procedure. Well, that was all good. Um, I think I know what it was. It doesn't matter. Uh, you know, it's usually a short-acting opiate, often something like fentanyl, which we used huge amounts since the 80s. Yeah. Um, and usually some midazolam, which is a, you know, way to improve anesthesia. In fact, that was one of the things I used to research was the benzodiazepines because it was a weak link within anesthesia was usually the amnesia. Okay. People will forgive you a lot, but they won't forgive you if you say that they're not going to have any memory of the operation and they do. Because at some conscious level, even with general anesthetic, if you talk negatively about that person during the procedure, they won't do as well. Okay. If you talk about them positively. I worked with one fellow in Calgary. Before they woke up, he'd go up and murmur all these things in their ear that they're going to do well and heal better. Because he was trying to work on that part. Because we have a lot more skill or talents with regard to the recovery process than we think. Mm -hmm. And if we think things are bad news or talking about us negatively, we don't do as well. Because mm -hmm. we really like to have that, you know, sense of well-being that we're going to do well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we have some questions, um, or actually some comments. So maybe I'll let you get to the first one, and I'm just going to shut these doors. Yeah, please. Yeah, both of them. So, Rogers had an interesting question <laughs> His grandma had died of pancreatic cancer and she worked for a dry cleaner. Well, and, it, and it's certainly a possibility of an overlay. There's no question that a component of cancer risk is toxicity. And toxicity working in a dry cleaning agent's place would increase the risk. And as many of you may or may not know, pancreatic cancer continues to go up in frequency. It's happening much more often. It's still a very difficult one to treat. So. And the, the aggravating feature today, of course, is Roundup, because Roundup takes away the liver's ability to break down toxins or compounds. So if you worked in a dry cleaning agent, ate regular food containing Roundup, and that's wheat, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and sugars, and a few other places now, because they're using it more and more often as a desiccant to harvest with, 
then that aggregates the feature. So there's probably a link in the two, Roger, you're being intuitive and correct, mm. I would think. So um, any advice on how to keep a gallbladder healthy? That's from Leah and no flare ups. Well, go back to my previous statement about avoid Roundup. Yeah. Because Roundup messes up the biliary tree, which is the gallbladder in the whole scenario, and has dramatically increased the number of people have to get their gallbladder out. Mm -hmm. Well, we did that whole, I think we did maybe one or two videos on detoxification, and we talk about the CYP450 mm -hmm. enzymes, which are really important for gallbladder health. Uh, so I would maybe go back to those videos. Well, for sure. So it has those in there, and it seems to also make a difference to the liver. If the liver isn't functioning optimally, it doesn't make the bile as well, mm -hmm. and the bile ducts and things don't work as well. And the bile ducts, of course, go into that storage depot, the gallbladder. Mm -hmm. And so if these aren't working well and they're, they're not optimal, you're getting more stone formation, you're getting more sludge formation. At the same time, we know that they're affecting the pancreatic duct and the pancreatic enzyme secondarily. So each of those function less well if you've got, you know, glyphosate or Roundup on board. And then, of course, mm -hmm. the other corollary I think we talked about when we talked about microbiome is that the microbiome is also a detoxification, detoxification component within mm -hmm. us, so all the bacteria within it. And if they're messed up, because Roundup acts as an antibiotic in them and messes them up, mm -hmm. then you've got three or four factors messing up your pancreas, your gallbladder, and so on. The other thing you might consider to minimize the flare-ups is digestive enzymes, mm -hmm. especially if you're getting at a little bit older age and you're not doing as well making your gallbladder, your bile, and so on. So trying to clean up what you're eating, well, I talk about that several times in the book, Solving the Brain Puzzle, but if in doubt, any of those foods, if you can possibly eat them organic. Mm -hmm. And I know it, 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 I can flare up and when we're traveling, you don't get much choice about organic restaurants and certainly not on a cruise and in most places in the world even if the food's fabulous it may have those risk factors in it you're going to be better off eating in europe mm -hmm. you're not going yeah. to be as well off eating in north america south america um, parts of the world even parts of australia you're going to have issues because they've used so much roundup and other you know spray toxins but the big nasty for the liver and detoxification is that one. Well, I would also consider, so if you've had testing and you've seen that your bile is sludgy, then consider incorporating bitter foods and drinks into your diet or mm -hmm. using something like Swedish bitters. Yeah, Swedish bitters and, and those sorts of things are fantastic. Mm -hmm. They are, and, and uh, we don't use them enough of them. Ayurvedic medicine has more major, four major food groups, right? Mm -hmm. And one of them is bitters. Mm -hmm. And people in North America, and I don't need to look any further than my wife Denise because she doesn't like bitter things. <laughs> I really focus and do as many bitter things as I can because mm -hmm. I know the balance is good for me. Exactly. It's good. I think it gives, well, I don't know the Chinese medicine term, so I won't even go there, but it's a big factor to make it how it's going. So the, I'll get another statement about having babies. So having babies, to touch on this because uh, everyone, if they're lucky enough, someone's having a baby in their group or family or maybe themselves. We know now that we can do, have a much healthier baby if there's any risk factor or stress for the mom or the baby, then often we tend to have the epidural sooner rather than later. So everybody's kind of in a, you know, optimal world. We won't have any anesthetic, we won't have any drugs. I don't buy into that. If you've got any complications going on that are stressing the baby, and that might be preeclampsia or toxemia, hypertension and pregnancy. The advantage of putting in an epidural, and epidurals have become much more refined. You're able to use a very weak amount of local anesthetic. Often you're only getting a sensory block, meaning you're taking the pain away or most mm -hmm. of the pain away, but you're not getting a motor muscle block. Yeah. And the advantage of that is as you take the pain away from the mother, because naturally in response to pain, you get a huge surge of adrenaline in the mother. Mm -hmm. So what does that do to the baby's blood supply? Well, adrenaline shrinks blood vessels. Okay. So the baby will go from the blood supply they're getting and the amount of oxygen in it 
to a reduced amount because the stress is squeezing down those vessels. Right. So it's much healthier to have a baby. And then often if that epidural is in place, they can quickly go to a cesarean section if they have to go to that equally as quickly as a general anesthetic. Mm -hmm. So general anesthetics for baby delivery are less and less common and that makes a better outcome for baby and for mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it goes that way. Conscious sedation. Sure. Well, I probably had some degree of conscious sedation because I was theoretically awake. I might even even still been talking to the people around me. I had no idea what I said. I hope it wasn't bad. Nobody told me about it, luckily. Because uh, people will say the most amazing thing. That's why the concept of truth serum used to be pentothal. Okay. okay? The barbiturates, you said things because you had taken away, the best way of thinking about it is the barbiturates or the benzodiazepines or some of these other drugs, scopolamine included, so-called truth serum, is they're reducing your inhibitions and they're reducing your ability to control what you're saying. Right. Okay, so you may have to say, well, I'm not going to tell them that I knew Aunt Mary or whatever, but you're going to. Yeah. <laughs> Often you're going to. So, you know, that's what conscious sedation is and mostly it's amnesia. Yeah. Okay, so that's the favorite group to do it. What was the best thing you ever heard? Oh, from people? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to go there because that's confidential. No. <laughs> Okay. Uh, when, you know, even though it's years later. The three times I had a general anesthetic, I'm not counting the one time I had an epidural, they had a difficult time waking me up. I remember the surgeon and the post-op team five inches from my face yelling, breathe, Sandra, breathe. I tell them I have this problem, but it still happens. The first time was in 1982, and the last two times were in 2008 and 2011. So I don't know if the same drugs would even have been used. Can you think of anything I can put on my medical record to use in case I have a future trip to the operating room? Well, no, it's a good question, Sandra. And it's a fairly common challenge. There's no question. Um, it likely is that you have a sensitivity to one group of drugs. The other possibility is that this is related to the um, muscle relaxants that are used as a component of the general anesthetic. So I talk pretty minimally about how anesthetics work, but we'll, we'll go over it just a little bit because it does help you understand it. So we're using something that helps give people amnesia and it helps to blunt the surgical knife movement, but often to make people completely still, we use something called muscle relaxation, okay? So the muscle relaxants, and it's a nice general safe term, but really what you're doing is paralyzing the sucker, mm -hmm. okay? I still remember a brilliant uh, anesthesiologist. He's a pediatric anesthetist from Pittsburgh. He did two great things. It is, one, he had a slide of, this is Pittsburgh, and it was, looked like a gorgeous night picture, and he said, this is Pittsburgh at noon. Of course, it was pretty polluted at that time. It's all cleaned up now. But the other thing he talked about was anesthetizing these little premature, little tiny babies. And so he called it PTS anesthesia. Okay. PTS anesthesia meant paralyze the sucker. So, of course, the baby didn't move. Surgeons are all happy. And hopefully they're giving, they will be giving something in, as an adjunct to it. But nobody has any idea whether a newborn is experiencing discomfort or pain or not. Mm -hmm. So we've got better at that over time, but early on, almost all pediatric anesthesia was almost only nitrous oxide. That was so-called Liverpool technique. So we've got better, we're trying to put in something for amnestics, and we're trying to put in something for pain relief. Number one, we don't want them to have pain, because that's relatively scarring, likely long term. So to what to put down, Sandra, when you're talking or contemplating on our anesthetic, important, mention because when you talk to your anesthetist, your nurse assessment prior to the operating room, uh, I was in for the nurse assessment a couple of weeks ahead of time, and then they find out whether you need to go and see an anesthesiologist ahead of time to talk about the details so that they can optimize it. Because the way the Canadian operating room system works, and it's pretty similar in the US, maybe not quite as push, 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 
but we get two to three minutes with people. Mm -hmm. So you really want to have most things sorted ahead of time because you can't sort everything in the last two or three minutes. So let them know because, and then they will be extra vigilant which agents they use. They will use more of the shorter acting agents and we've got shorter and shorter and shorter acting agents, including the narcotics. They've got some that last minutes. Mm. And they've got muscle relaxants that break down very quickly now, mm. not the long-term ones. When we had the relatively long terms, and the first one that you will know, most of you, would be tubo curare. It used to be called D tubo curare. So, and that meant it was curare because curare was used by the African tribes, I think pygmies, and they would blow blow darts at animals, and they would have enough curare in them to paralyze the animal. Mm. And so they would go up and slit the throat and all those other pieces. So those long acting muscle relaxants, and we've got still some long acting ones, and that's what they use in the intensive care unit. If you're unlucky enough to get on to a ventilator for any purpose, including, God forbid, under COVID, they will, we even developed a new verb. We called it pavulonize. And pavulon was one of the long acting anesthetics, pancuronium, which worked as long or longer than curare. But you must, do some form of amnesia treatment and other treatment to snow the person because being awake paralyzed is incredibly unpopular right you try to breathe you can't move anything so it could be a combination of one or two of those pieces but it's very likely the inability to wake up when they're telling you to breathe and breathe number one on the list is a huge sensitivity to narcotics or opiates because they suppress the breathing center. And you can get people to wake up pain free, but if they're not breathing, this isn't a good scene. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you even have to put the tube back in and help them breathe while things wear off. And so in a hush, hush, sorry, rush, rush milieu around an operating room, no favors if you're delayed. Right. So you try to get that right. So really stressing those features and then they will be extra vigilant with their muscle relaxants and their other agents and even their narcotics, maybe the shorter acting ones or minimizing what you're doing. And the other thing is that, you know, being really vigilant about telling them what your pattern is. Now, I happen to know that Sandra has MS. So it is possible in the whole mix of things, she has an individual pathway within her and is less able to break down medications and drugs than the ordinary Ooh. average individual. Anytime we get someone with a long-term chronic illness, mm -hmm. one of the variables in their path is their individual genetic pathways. They may not break things down as well as completely. I wish I had my chart on me. Remember how I was reading off that chart the other day? It yeah. actually listed some drugs that um, you need optimal pathways. Of for course. Breaking down. Yeah. And drugs are the same, and some toxins are the same. Mm -hmm. some, and we, we inevitably get toxins in our water, our air, and our food. So if we're in a group, of, and one of those pathways is somewhat jeopardized, and sometimes we can find it out um, mm -hmm. by doing a very careful genetic testing, it doesn't really solve the problem. Mm -hmm. You still have to treat it the same way. Now, once in a while, you're lucky, as mm -hmm. you know, you, if you boost your B6 and your B12 and your folate, then your methyl reduction pathways will improve. Mm -hmm. Or you go whey protein or N-acetylcysteine to boost your glutathione. Mm -hmm. And each of those methods would be optimal to do before surgery. Yeah. And so I, you know, I routinely do those. My homocysteine measures at seven. I just looked up today. That's why I mm -hmm. can remember. But. If the homocysteine is down about seven or less, you don't want it lower than five, probably. Five is okay. Five to seven is kind of an optimal range for homocysteine. That shows that your methyl and methylation pathways are working pretty well. And mine aren't perfect because I'm heterozygote in that. But if I take those extra components in the B pathway vitamins, then I do better. Mm -hmm. And many people will be like that and I find it more and more often, in fact, even in mental health problems, it's the same deal. 
you've got to get some source of what is the pathway that's awry in this individual. Exactly. And you can often treat it with diet, mm -hmm. you know, as you become really good at doing and understanding that. And sometimes it's part of the diet, which is enhancing the alternate parts of those pathways. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's letting that ordinary pathway work better. It's just that that's an individual personal variation. You can't change it anyway, mm -hmm. but you can epigenetically, meaning you can modify. It. Right. Yeah. So I'm hoping that that helps you understand it. CSF leaks from epidurals. Those happen. Mm -hmm. So in my first, well, not my first, but my second or third question for my anesthesiologist was, what needle are you using now for spinals? Because 20, 30 years ago, we started to study, because usually we used a cutting, a very sharp needle to go in. But the downside of that is it cups, it cuts the fibers of the dura completely. Okay. All right? And that's why I still get irritated because some of the neurologists still use an 18 gauge, which is pretty big in the scheme of things, uh, needle to do their spinal taps on MS patients. And my sister had a ripping headache for two weeks. In fact, it, to some degree, is diagnostic. If you get a ripping headache and you're investigating for your MS, you've almost for sure got it. Mm -hmm. I learned that from a brilliant uh, MS neurologist. She was a woman in uh, Dr. Weinstock Goodman in Buffalo, New York. But anyway, so I was very happy because he said, well, now we've got the pencil point. So a pencil point needle spreads the fibers. It goes through the fibers and it was 25 gauge which is really tiny compared to an 18. So I was in, because that's what I wanted, because I didn't want a headache. The other thing I'd learned and I asked, can I be sitting up when you do my epidural or spinal, in my case it was a spinal, sitting up increases the cerebral spinal fluid pressure in the lower part, because you know, it's gravity. You've got a column above, which brings down and increases the pressure. As you increase the pressure, it's easier to get the spinal fluid coming back through the needle. Because mm -hmm. as you can imagine, if you've got a little more pressure, it's going through a very tiny tube. So you need the, the pressure to help it. Because I think back to a, a young fellow, he was almost quadriplegic with his MS. He couldn't sit up, didn't want to sit up. So we did it on his side. I had a very tough time getting it. And I was in multiple times. And he had a ripping headache. Sadly, he left for the for Asia a day or two later on an airplane. So I was not a popular guy in this world. Mm -hmm. So because most people with MS and some of us with other brain injuries tend to have a low cerebral spinal fluid pressure. Consequently, you're going to have a bigger problem doing that. So if you recognize all those parts going in, then you're going to have less likely of a cerebral spinal fluid leak. We did treat cerebral spinal fluid leaks. One of my high school classmates delivered a baby when I was working in Saskatoon and she had an epidural and she had a leak. And so I went to see her and we do what we call a blood patch. Mm -hmm. So you put your epidural, you put a new epidural in place above or below where you think the problem is. Usually one level above or one level below you. Sometimes you'll go to the level that is maybe better not to. And then when you've got that in place, you take some blood from the person's arm, 20 cc's, 30 cc's, and you inject it into the eye. So what you're effectively doing is you're letting that blood go in with those tissue around it, it will clot, and you're hopefully putting a patch, a little bit like a tire patch on that leak of cerebral spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. So good question, and we do have a treatment, and it almost always works. Okay. Off topic, like to know the benefits of emu oil. Well, there is components of the chapter in the book, happily, talking about the pain relief of emu oil. Simple thing, because I'm one of the world experts of physicians knowledgeable about emu oil in any shape or form, so it's a very easy group. But when I talked about pain relief options besides narcotics, the 1996 to the 11th Congress of Anesthesiologists in Sydney, Australia, I included emu oil, partly a tribute to the Australian hosts, but it's anti-inflammatory. It goes through the skin well and carries other agents through it with it. So in modern day, that would be CBDs and other things. Mm -hmm. um, and as well, it's a great emollient for emulsion. 
So pain relief, anti-inflammatory, and a great lubricant on the skin. Okay. Sandra is asking, I asked for an epidural for my knee surgery in 2011, and the anesthesiologist said he wouldn't stick a needle in a spine of somebody with MS. Yeah, so... Well, that's what you were saying at the beginning. Yeah, I can sit here very comfortably today and say, that guy's out of date. Yeah. However, you're stuck. You get there, you're assigned that anesthesiologist. So unless you request one ahead of time. So here's a tip today. Almost any time you're booked for surgery, you can make a request of an anesthetic. Mm -hmm. Sorry, of an anesthesia particular specialist. So the wise thing to do would be find out who the anesthetists are, figure out which ones you might like to have. In a perfect world, you'll know somebody that works there, or you, if you're really lucky, you might know one of the anesthetists. But you can list two or three anesthetists. When I worked in Calgary, one of the hospitals, there was a couple of anesthetists everybody did not want to have. Right. But you can't request a negative fashion. Hospitals and bureaucracies don't handle negative fashions very well. So instead of listing, I don't want Dr. A or B, you should list that I would like to have Dr. C, D, or maybe E. Okay. And if you give them two or three choices, because C might be on holidays, D might be on call at night. So anyway, Give them some choices and you'll likely get an anesthetist that you can interact with. Because if this is part of your vigilance. You usually very carefully, or hopefully your family doctor, very carefully chose your surgeon. So try and put some input into the other part as well. This is your homework. If it's an emergency, not an option. But most of these are elective procedures. And so you can do that extra piece. From Warren, my memory is shot now. Any suggestions? I'm running out of post-it notes. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, hi Warren. Good to hear from you again. So, number one suggestion, buy a copy of Solving the Brain Puzzle. And there's an oral copy. If that doesn't work for you, you know, go to drbillcode.com. We've now, we've got it up in Soon to have it up in Spanish, German, and French, but English works too, and it's Earl, because there's a whole host of memory problems, and MS is a very typical one. Renewed sources of oxygen, reduced amounts of toxins, use your brain all the time as much as you can, optimize your sleep. There's a whole host of things. Almost all of them make a difference in post-operative cognitive dysfunction, and they make a difference in the MS problem too. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, I've now done probably 650 hyperbaric oxygen treatments. I've only been at it for about five and a half years, and I've done, a, um, I've done 150 since I got home on the 4th of February this year, because I'm stuck home with COVID. I'm lucky enough I can still do it because it's nearby. And that's made a big difference to my brain recovery. So my cognitive challenges were increasing. I was starting to have more discomfort with driving, especially in a busy city. Mm -hmm. But now most of those pieces have recovered. So I'm really happy because most of these are reversible ones. You're gonna have to do some effort to reverse them, but most of them are reversible. You have no reason to give up, whether it's your brain or your heart, a lot of recovery is available. Just because a neurologist or someone tells you there's no way back, nonsense. Often there's a way back. Mm -hmm. And you got to get your gut really healthy too. And if you need help for that, go to mindmoodmicrobes.ca. Mindmoodmicrobes.ca, which is the website that Christina Mitz, my colleague, runs. And, you know, she can help you with the gut issues. There's no question. Well, I'm also thinking about the neurotransmitters because some of them are associated with memory as well. Um, mm -hmm. What about acetylcholine? Well, acetylcholine is, is the background kicker for Aricep, which is the one we've had for 20, 30 years now for Alzheimer's. It works a tiny bit. Okay. So don't think of the neurotransmitters. Think of the big picture overall. Because right. if you get the gut, microbiome healthy, 
then all of a sudden the micro the neurotransmitters start to get better and that's why you get the microbiome healthy it helps depression it helps anxiety it helps cognitive change because it's a tremendous mix mm -hmm. of the two together and by the second week when i was having my gut floral transplant over in the uk and i think it was 2017 you know by the middle of the second week my brain was clear again right so that is another place to go to it's tricky because you got to go to the bahamas or slovakia or the britain UK. for that now currently because of the changes but that's okay. life the way it is um i think we're at the bottom yep. okay we're that's the end through. of the questions we're got another five minutes left so i think i haven't stressed quite enough about the post-operative cognitive dysfunction so 10 to 30 percent uh at one week or one month out at three months it's down to 10 percent but that's it's higher for sure if you have coronary artery bypass surgery or major heart surgery because you're on a heart lung bypass machine and that seems to interfere and i think it interferes because it doesn't optimize the oxygen delivery to the brain during the procedure mm -hmm. it's never quite the same to get that mildly pulsatile almost continuous flow versus the ordinary blood pressure system the body works better under its regular model and system the other feature is if you can get your brain optimized before you go in for surgery so do all the features that you can do all the pieces of reducing your toxins you know you're going to have some toxins from the anesthetic and the drugs you can't avoid that so you've got to optimize all your other pieces so that might mean taking regular n-acetylcysteine ahead of time whey protein b6 b12 and folate and all those other features to reduce your chances of those problems and how to reverse them after and if i could i would ask you i'm hoping most of you now with any brain problem are getting an oxygen concentrator at home mm -hmm. and so if you're in a day surgery patient as soon as you get home get on your oxygen and stay on it for 24 48 hours because it's going to help some of the oxygen delivery system. And buy your own pulse oximeter. And, but remember, what you're measuring out here on your fingertip, in a perfect world, you'd have it measured on your forehead or your ear, because that's much closer to what the brain is getting. Just because it's 94 out on the fingertip, doesn't mean that that regional part of the brain that's struggling is anywhere near 94. It's probably less. Okay. Consequently, if you go from a 98 pulse oximeter to 99 down to 92 you've dropped your circulating dissolved oxygen from 100 millimeters of mercury to 60. already because when the hemoglobin and the red blood cell arrives in the brain to deliver its oxygen it still has to let it go into the plasma goes through the blood vessel wall and through the fluids uh, bathing the cells and it does that on a downhill diffusion gradient. And if you're too low a number when you start the downhill gradient, you're not gonna get it to all the places. And hence the concept, as I talk about in the book, of the sleeping neuron, the neuron that's not functioning. It's still alive, but it's not functioning, so you're not thinking clearly. So it is part of the option to reverse it. So in a perfect world, I hope one day, if people are in hospital, They'll put them on at least three liters of, of oxygen nasal prongs mm -hmm. overnight for the first day because that will start to diminish, I would suggest. I can't prove it, but it's very inexpensive. Most oxygen hospitals, in hospitals, it's blown off in waste. So everybody thinks they're saving money. They're not. Use that oxygen more frequently, three liters a minute. I don't care what the pulse oximeter says because we're trying to get it to the critical parts of the brain and that's what you need to try and do to think about right so i think that gets us through most of it mm -hmm. so next week i'm traveling happily to vernon bc my daughter's getting married pretty happy time in our family and so that will be superb and then denise and i are thinking about driving up the alaska highway mm -hmm. so we'll see how that goes and as a side piece, if anybody out there has contacts on the way up, I think we're going to go up by a 100-mile house, Quinnell, Prince George, and then on up the Alaska Highway. 
as best we can through Fort Nelson, Dawson Creek. I'm still not great on the terms. To Whitehorse, Dawson City, and in a perfect world, we get over the Dempster Highway to Inuvik. And maybe even up to Tuktoyaktok because in 2017, they completed the road from Inuvik to Tuktoyaktok. That's COVID and health and everything else permitting. Mm -hmm. That's what we'll do. So we're going to be back again here in about a month. So we'll keep you posted, follow it. Once again, you can follow up on today's. It'll soon be posted on our website or my website, drbillco.com. And you can look there for the other, you know, under blog for either, both the audio or the videos of the ones that we've already done. Because we've worked during, working our way through the book. Today was chapter 13. There's 26 chapters. And we're going into the nitty gritty as we go on forward. In a couple of times, we'll be talking about cannabis. Probably two sessions on cannabis because there's 50 pages in the book on it. Because it really is a useful adjunct to many of the pieces we're doing. Not the least of which is that CBDs boost your brain-derived neurotrophic protein, BDNF, which helps us more neurons, new neurons, and more connections between our neurons. Okay. So I think that's it for today. Anything you want to add? Nope, I think that's good. Okay, have a great summer, early fall, and we'll see you after the equinox. Okay, bye for now.